Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Star Citizen Live, uh, the USPU feature team. I'm your host, Jared Huckabee. And joining us on the show this week are three members of our esteemed USPU feature team. Uh, we've got a lot to talk about today, so we're going to jump right into it with some quick introductions because everybody sh every show is somebody's first show. We're going to start immediately to my right here. Uh, Chad, who are you? What do you do for Star Citizen? Yeah, hi, my name is Chad McKinney, and I'm a lead gameplay engineer on the USPU gameplay team. And what's a what's an engineer do? Yeah, program, we, we make the features in the engine that, you know, in, in coordination with design. So we actually, you know, make, make the fun stuff is the way I like to put it. Okay. Uh, ben, no stranger to Inside Star Citizen, but who are you for Star Citizen Live? Hi, I'm Ben Dorsey. I am a senior systems designer on USPU, um, which means that I um, do a lot of the planning and coordination and then some of the implementation um, for a few various things. In this case, uh, features like reputation and then uh, content like uh, Nine Tails or Jump Town, too. Mm -hmm. And classic calling all devs rock star, Rob Reiniger. Who are you and what do you do for Star Citizen? Uh, I, my name is Rob Reiniger. I have actually recently been promoted to the assistant director of the Systemic Gameplay Services pillar. So it's uh, classically working with the USPU team here uh, as product owner of, of several of the, the features that we've done, uh, getting to work more with our SST team and the MFT team here in the future. Uh, so be getting, getting quite involved with the, the simulation here moving forward. And uh, once again, congratulations on your sharks themed uh, uh, office paint job. It's it was nice. I, I saw it the other day. It was cool. Still there. <laughs> yeah, and it's waiting for you when you return to office. All right. Oh, so okay. uh, on today's show, we are talking uh, U.S. features. So. What does that mean? Every team in Star Citizen works on a finite number of features. Not every team works on every feature in the game. We also are on the road to digital citizen con. So there are lots of uh, uh, topics and subjects uh, being uh, held close to our chest right now in preparation for the various panels and presentations that are coming on October 9th. So we do have a, 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 a focus of, of stuff that this team is working on that are, we're approved to talk about today and you know saving other stuff for CizenCon. Uh, we put up a thread up in Spectrum where we collected questions throughout the week and let people vote up on the ones they wanted to see answered most. Uh, and one of the biggest topics that was voted up was cargo refactor. So we're going to start. We're going to start with some questions on the Sweet. cargo refactor first. Um, right off the bat, why don't we just set the stage here? What is the cargo refactor and what isn't the cargo refactor? Sure. What, what are we actually trying to do here? What are we talking about when we say cargo the refactor? Cargo can be refactored in many ways to help make the game play better. We've obviously got the cargo profession that we're working towards, but specifically the way cargo worked. So in the past here, uh, up till we re finished this, um, when you bought something from a shop, it got statically placed into your ship's cargo hold and you could not interact with it. Uh, when the ship exploded, we kind of jettisoned out, you know, smaller versions of the boxes that you could actually grab and, and take back to your ship, uh, which could then be sold at a shop somewhere but this refactor is going to give us a kind of a clean slate as far as how we define what our commodities are there was some some stuff that was just legacy that caused problems that we wanted to fix uh, but the big thing for the players is that it's going to be physicalized in the cargo within the cargo grid uh, it also sets us up for some other stuff that we're going to talk about in a bit you know persistent hangers and just the, the cargo gameplay as a whole. But uh, from the player's perspective, it's it's the physicalization of the cargo. You can now tractor beam stuff off the grid. Uh, you can also tractor beam stuff onto the grid. You're also going to be able to jettison larger size boxes, right? So it's not just going to be the small ones anymore. We can, we can start doing the bigger ones. So as far as what I would expect to see in the first iteration of it would be generally that. Yeah, if I could just add to that, one thing that I would say is I think everybody's or hopefully everyone's noticing that there's all this effort now with loot and inventory that's been coming out. Cargo is being uh, refactored, you know, just kind of re reimagined in this new world where we have localized inventory. What that means is that there are gonna be commodities uh, in certain kinds of containers that have various compositional contents for the various commodities that you'll wanna trade, but there'll also be things that are 
inventory containers as well that can contain actual items and they can nest. So inventory is containers themselves or entities. So this can mean that you can be uh, potentially trading in, in, in shipping in your cargo grid inventory as well as commodities, which means that looting is, is going to be available for the contents inside of the cargo grids as well. And the contents as you move them around, the, the localization of them is going to become much more important to the future, uh, unlike right now. All right. So as far as the, the diving into some of the questions that we're seeing from both the live chat and the spectrum thread here, uh, right off the bat, uh, will we be able to take other people's cargoes or other people's cargo, uh, both forcibly and or with permission, I'm glad they allowed for both options, as well as uh, the saddlebags on the prospector or the mole. So there's a couple questions in there. So let's do the first one. Uh, will, we, will we be able to take cargo from other people uh, forcibly or with permission? That, as long as you can access it, uh, whether it be through you know their cargo grid, getting into their ship somehow, if you can disable the ship without blowing it up, right, and can get in, sneak onto their ship, you can maybe get off with some valuable packages. Um, so yeah, and, and uh, I guess one of the things that we kind of missed talking about the, the refactor here is that this, the, the way that the prospector bags, for instance, were, were set up uh, was that they were all kind of part of the ship, right? It was just an animated pod, but that this will set us up to allow us to detach those uh, for other people to come and pick them up, taking them to refineries so that the mining ship can keep going. So it, it is kind of like a all-inclusive, you know, uh, it, it's just an item like any other item at this point, right? And whether it's attached to the outside of a ship or placed inside of a ship, it's it's, it's kind of all that. Okay. It's kind of cool. And, so, and for clarity, when that first started even getting discussed within the team, within the first five seconds, people were talking about like how cool it would be to run a heist and break into someone's ship and take their stuff or force them to give you stuff because they, you, you've, you've threatened to blow them up if they don't like, that is 100%. 100%. Yeah, and on the technical side, if I could just like kind of clarify a little bit. Previously, cargo instead of cargo grids were really just some data and, and some persistent yeah. representation. And we're changing it to be uh, represented as entities. And, and for anyone that's not familiar with like, you know, game dev terminology, an entity is, is this really generic term for just something that like a player might see in the game. So what that means is that um, the cargo boxes, the um, you know those those prospector whatever bag things, uh, these these things are going to be things that we have a lot more uh, ability to allow to simulate independently, so that they can attach, detach. You can interact with them in, uh, individually. Uh, so that gives us a lot of leeway to open up new gameplay opportunities, like actually stealing the sacks and, and then putting them onto your ship or putting them inside another ship and just getting creative and other players do very interesting things. Uh, but yeah, so just largely a, a big part of this is just making them actually interactable objects in the world individually as opposed to these like static fixed things. Yeah, yeah 100%. And definitely seems like uh, it's ripe for... Uh, future progress on things like piracy and stuff like that because now yeah. th these things will be because they're physicalized in the world now now they can survive explosions and, and stuff like that absolutely yeah and and could be damaged right so we want to be able to damage a container that might devalue what's in it or you know it, it opens the door for a lot of the things that we've said we've wanted to do with cargo over the last couple of years and and sets us up for you know being able to put a volatility system on it or you know it's like yeah cool it reacts to this other thing just because it's near it right like because it's physically degradation. yeah degradation uh but because it's physically an item we can start to calculate those things independently of each other uh which is really nice and for the folks in the chat they're asking about when keep an eye on the public roadmap all when questions are answered by the public i uh, know yeah. as best as we're able to anyway uh, let's see, what else do we got in the cargo factor? In regard to the cargo refactor, will there be any Lego style or snap to option, uh, or snap to option to get boxes stacked nice and tidy when manually placed by hand or tractor beam or anything else? So that, that was one of the things when we were starting to, to talk about what this refactor means. Um, this is a bigger feature that, that spans more than just the USPU team. And then much like we're working with the actor feature team on the, the personal inventory and the asset manager to kind of help go with that. Um, this is something that, that we're going to need to work with them on because that's a personal player experience uh, thing that they, you know, that's the mining tool or the tractor beam or the, the 
the PA tool, right? So um, we will provide the hooks in order for them to to be able to do that. We, we said snapping is almost a mandatory thing that we need, right? Uh, so when they're ready, it should should have all the hooks they need to kind of just snap it in. And uh, I think I think the the first thing I would expect to see would probably be tractor beam interaction on that level, and then the the physical placement. Um, it probably need a little extra work just from the actor movement and, and you know animation side of things, but uh, certainly would be able to use the same data uh, to do the snapping. Yeah, te technically we're implementing it, expecting that coming, and it's it's a planned part. The first release of cargo may not include direct interaction and, and Lego style snapping, but um, the functionality under the hood from the cargo system will support it. Okay. Uh, now, folks who have been uh, who who've been paying attention to uh, social media today have noticed that the Star Citizen account announced that 314 is expected to go live later today. Uh, talking about 314, one of the one of the new uh, um, highlight features of that is our Nine Tails Lockdown uh, dynamic event that we've talked to in the past, uh, Ben. Uh, we have a couple questions about Nine Tails Lockdown. Does this event trigger from in-game actions? Or is it like Xenothreat where it's scheduled and, and started by the developers? Uh, it is it is started by developers. It's not even automatically scheduled. That's actually another step that we want to take is allowing it to be put on basically like a calendar and, and put like a, a date and time on it. Um, that was supposed to be the next step. But uh, frankly, all that Tony has been able to talk about for the past few weeks is actually wanting to make it so that it's triggered by things in game potentially. So that schedule might get a little bit flipped up. Um, but it is definitely intended that eventually some form of in-game actions will cause these to happen, be that increasing the piracy level in an area to the point where Ninetales thinks that they have a shot, or even just doing missions for them to the point where they get enough resources as an organization to kind of um, build up the fleet that they need to do these kinds of things. And, and that's for all world events in the future. That is the plan that eventually these are all kind of driven by that simulation of what's going on and player actions gotcha and if you want to know even more about nine tails lockdown check out the uh, segment we did on inside star citizen uh towards the end of last quarter it's available on youtube now one more nine tails question before we move on though uh when nine tails locks down a station or a landing zone will players still passively spawn there uh when joining the pu or does that affect your login locations if it is where you were set, then you you stay there. Yes, uh, I do not do anything to affect you there whatsoever. Um, that's not to say that we never will, uh, particularly if in some distant future there's a time when they actually take over that station. That might have some ramifications to people there that aren't friendly with Ninetales. But um, for now, no, you will log back in right on that station. So there's an opportunity for some... Uh juicy game starts just well, log in casually you know have have a fun persistent universe experience and you're in the middle of a giant pvp Which event has some knock-on fun potential mm -hmm. gameplay of like i need to hire someone to come in with some big guns and rescue me and that sounds awesome in some ways mm -hmm. or terrifying so yeah you know. no uh the next week's uh isc actually is all about that merging of uh, pve and pvp uh that we that we shoot for in the persistent universe so check that out uh, next week. Okay, um, Chad, one of the su subjects that we posted about on Spectrum that's like, garnered a lot of like perked ears and like, what? What is this? Procedural character generation. So let's start with the basics. What is it and what isn't it? Yeah, well, what is going on here? Um, so this is part of, uh, I would say, a much larger, larger initiative of Tony's. So if you, you've been paying attention, you'll see all these big ideas being thrown about, about like dynamic populations, and virtual AI, and missions, and all this stuff. And at a certain point, uh, you have to ask the question of how are these things being populated? Where does the content come from? And then whenever you start thinking about that, you also start to wonder about okay, well, what about the locations in the game? What about just the universe that we're trying to build, the number of solar systems we're you know, intending to make? And quickly, we run up on a problem, which is that we really just cannot reasonably hand author all of the characters in the game to get the scale that we're looking for and get the dynamism that we're looking for and to get the kind of, uh, I would say, kind of persistence that we're looking for and the reaction to the character, the players in the game. So. 
procedural character generation is uh, you know, one tool to address this problem. And the idea is essentially that instead of hand offering, you know, the vast majority of the characters in the game, uh, take, which takes a lot of time, right? There's a lot of very manual markup that's very bespoke. Um, you know, for example, you know, may, people may not be aware, but like if you just take like a random engineer in the game, right? Uh, there would be like a hundred variants of this that hand authored loadouts have been created for them in order to add the kind of variety in the game that you hope to see. Uh, and even still, right, people notice the, the repetition, right? You'll, you'll see the same characters. And the thing is, you, you want a certain amount of that. You want a certain amount of seeing the same characters in similar scenarios. Um, but at a certain point, there's a kind of uncanny valley where it's like, okay, if that person was just walking over there and I was see them over here, right? So the idea is that by using a, a process that's a kind of seated randomness that is designer guided with, a, with that's rules driven, we can kind of work from, how would I, I would describe it? I would say you can kind of work from like what the world that we want to build is backwards to a set of rules that allow us to generate characters to fill out that world in a way that is a combination of varied and makes sense. So this is the tricky bit. Um, for any kind of procedural system, you're going to have challenges where uh, if you don't have enough kind of semantics built into the system, you're going to have just incredibly varied results. They're going to be quite heterogeneous. And what it's going to mean is that it's just going to seem like random. And it's going to seem like there's no sense to it. You get variety, but it doesn't seem like there's any sensibility that ties it together. Once you start constraining that with any set of rules, then what you end up as a problem is the opposite. You end up with something quite homogenous. You know, if you go look at, for example, um, No Man's Sky and all, all the planets, right? They're using a procedural system to generate, you know, their 18 quintillion planets or something, which is very cool. Um, but at, at a certain point, you see enough planets, there's a sameness to it. And that's that's going to be true of any procedural system. So the trick is how do you how do you balance it to get the variety that you want, but still sculpt it to have the kind of um, this the kind of um, threads that are that are taken through the characters, and and so what my work is is to build a system in collaboration with design and collaboration with uh, character art narrative all of that to figure out the world that we're trying to build and see how we can encode that into the data for gameplay and, and uh, environmental reasons, and then draw upon that in order to generate characters at runtime that make sense in situations. And then the cool part is that these are going to be persistent characters. So you'll be able to see them again, potentially on the situation or on the locations. So you know everything from shopkeepers to security engineers will we'll go through this process. So it's kind of a, just a high level ramble <laughs> all right so that sounds like what one two sprints worth of work yeah uh we're, we're thinking <laughs> about that it's totally not gonna be that but and, uh, no this is a big it, a it, this is huge right and and the cool thing about this though is that it it really has kind of caused us to all come together as the different groups within the company to to agree and and you know formulate a a cohesive vision for exactly how all of these things tie together because a lot of times what happens is we go and we build our thing and and works really well looks really good and, and sometimes doesn't tie here but this this is going to be you know tied to objective values of the items or how does how does a military guy know what he wants to use well he uses you know things that shoot fast or high magazine capacities and we can start to build out a, a list of stuff that makes sense for those characters and then diversify them based on you know how much they care about those things um and it, it's from a character perspective it, it's really cool because we were we were going yeah we want engineers we want you know tourists and and whatever but now we can actually start thinking about like where did they come from they actually had a home planet and that home planet well their their dna is is mixed generally in these ways so now you can get people that look like culturally like they came from someplace um wearing clothes and, and styles from those locations. And uh, they could even behave, you know, prefer items of, you know, whatever type, but that's that's the the type of thing that we're gonna be able to build as a result of this. And, you know, I, I don't know how much the, the public knows about how many character entities we have in the game, but we've literally got like 
Area 18 civilian won through 187 Ben Shaken and Sand Casinos. Like <laughs> it is it is ridiculous. And this will allow us to go, we have a civilian. And the location that he gets spawned drives some of these choices. The the core archetype distinction uh, that some designer set up is the you know another bulk of those choices. Uh, what organization may be another layer of choices, right? So, but it's a, it's a logical, you know, building up of this character that we no longer have to really like stay on top of so much that, oh, this, why is this guy here? Somebody just copy and paste it. I'm like, no, no, no. This, the, the system knows where he needs to go. They know it's cold on the planet. So he's going to be wearing something that's warm, right? We can start to, to build all of this stuff together as a single single experience which is why i kind of threw my hands up in the beginning i was like yes this is this is this is the dynamic game and the beginning of the of the dynamism that we have talked about for a very long time mm. so it's it's super exciting well for those playing a star citizen drinking game at home that was one bespoke one systemic and uh, two dynamics so uh four shots everybody <laughs> all right uh yeah. persistent hangers Persistent hangers. Uh, we hear this term, and of course, the, the the very first module that was ever released in Star Citizen's development was our personal hanger system. So uh, there, there's a lot of when they when we hear the term persistent hangers, there's a lot of misconceptions that I immediately arise uh, going back, linking one to the other. So right off the bat, our first question is, what is the difference between persistent hangers and the personal hangers that citizens are familiar with? The, the idea was, at least to my knowledge, was that the, these personal hangers were actually meant to be some place that was in the game. Um, you know, asteroid hangers were supposed to be on some place like Grim Hex or wherever. Um, the the Revel in York was supposed to be a microtech hanger, right? So it's, I, I would not necessarily look at them as different places, but what we're going to provide is is a place that you can customize you can leave stuff and on the floor and when you come back it will be there it, it is your place kind of like the haves where you can kind of go and dump stuff in your haves but but on a much larger scale um these are, these will be things that you can buy they'll be yours you can rent them maybe um things of that nature right uh it'll allow players to manage larger scales of cargo things like that uh you know you can store like hangers are pretty big right so you can line some cargo up down one side and then spawn a different ship and then whoop, put it on that one um so it's in a nutshell it's 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 taking that personal hanger and really just kind of transplanting that into the game and allowing the game to persist it uh in whatever state you leave it yeah i mean if i could just add i would say that persistent hangers are kind of a superset of hangers where they include the personal hangers, which are now persistent, um, but also will include other hangers that you could potentially interact with for, for other reasons. Because we're now going to make them something that you own, that means that there's going to be some locality tied to them. And there are going to be situations in the game where you may not have access to a, a hanger that you actually own at a given location. And there are going to be a set of processes in place that still allow you to facilitate certain gameplay loops um, so that might mean maybe renting a hanger or having a temporary hanger for a certain transaction. Um, uh, and it even opens the door, you know, potentially for things like uh, hangers associated with characters or missions and things like that. Um, so, but yeah, Rob, you know, exactly right. That effectively what we're doing is, you know, I mentioned before that cargo was being turned into entities. And then that allows us to have a certain amount of uh, persistent gameplay associated with them. Same thing is true with the hangers. We're going to now have the ability to, to simulate them as, as entities very similar to ships, actually. So, you know, right now in the game, you can already like drop things in your ship, put ships inside of ships and store and restore them, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, hangers are going to start acting a lot more like that. And players are going to hopefully, you know, start thinking of them as something that's like an important part of their their kind of fleet, their, their, their gameplay set. So the, the, the player hangers that people are familiar with, the Rebel in York and the and stuff like that, uh, those are under the umbrella, the greater umbrella of precision hangers. But when they see the first version of precision hangers show up on the roadmap and you know eventually make its way into the game, uh, it is not that right away. It is, it is working with the hangers that are, are there in game today, you know the Area 18 ones and the Lorvo ones, and and creating persistent storage. And yeah, so uh, imagine. Uh, you're going to choose your starting location of Area 18, and then 
the ships that you have at Area 18, you'll have a hangar there that comes with your starting, you know, location selection, right? And that's that's now your hangar. Uh, instead of hangar 27, it's you know Rob's hangar, uh, Rob's medium hangar, whatever. Um, and just like any other hab or, or persistent location, you can go there. Now the the only thing that uh, like we're not going to build like one hangar entrance for every single player that's actually on the server, right? Or or in the game as a whole, it's uh, going to be controlled through ATC. So you're going to contact ATC, say, "Hey, I'm ready to go," and and Chad can talk maybe about uh, more of the the technical side of this of how we're going to be bouncing you know players around. But basically, we're going to take you, we're going to move you while you're doing your stuff inside your hangar, and then, "Hey, I'm ready to go." ATC gives you clearance. That opens up a door, doors open, you fly out directly into the city and it's all from your persistent hangar space. Yeah, so I'll just go a little bit into detail on that. So the idea is that no matter what, uh, for now we're gonna have the locations that don't have the number of hangars to support even the current player limit, let alone whatever we yeah. increase that to with server meshing, right? So for that reason, we we're always gonna have this problem of too many players mapped to too few hangers. However, we do want to maintain the, the kind of player experience of feeling like you do own a hanger at a certain location for even these ones where they're too few. And so for that reason, we're actually gonna pin the players to particular hanger entrances so that in your experience as a player, you'll go land somewhere, you'll, you'll fly away from somewhere. And it's always from the same hanger at that location physically. Now there is you know the players uh, may notice that there's going to be a kind of you know magical sensibility to it which because if we have 100 players in the server or whatever or even the current 50 then you know the same players will be using the same hangar entrance and exits you know how's that possible and the reason is is because there's some magic happening behind the, the hood where we're, we're magically moving these things around and we're using zones to isolate them from each other um, so that you don't see the fact that they're, you know, all getting kind of intermixed, but the experience for the players is that it's one continuous experience in and out. Now, that's for these locations, again, that have a more limited set. We absolutely, with this system, can expand it to have locations with larger amounts of hangers, which would then allow us to do things like individually put down um, persistent hangers for players and you know, that would probably have to work in accordance with some kind of procedural system for, for placing out very large numbers of them. And we do, you know, I, you know, I know this comes up a lot, players are very aware that we have we have the real estate, right? We have these huge planets, like what are we doing with all this space? Certainly that's an opportunity, but for the, for the first out, um, we're not gonna have that, you know, unique one-to-one -one hangar experience for each location. Instead, it's going to be working with the locations that we have now, but the system, will support um, as we make it will support it in the future if we can work in accordance with the environment and level design teams uh, and planet teams to yeah. facilitate the other part that would be required to have that kind of experience it's like with anything else in star citizen you bring it to the point of realism then you bring it back to the point of fun and it, it, and it's it, people who you know, if you physicalized every single hangar for every single player on the thing somebody would have to park you know, 13 kilometers out from Area 18 and have a 15 minute shuttle ride on the way in just to sell off their stuff and stuff like that. So we have to find, try to find that mix and match. But of course, as the game progresses and expands and stuff like that, we certainly do have the real estate to, to push well, farther and farther towards that realism. So uh, like with anything, it'll continue to change and evolve. Uh, one of the one more question about persistent hangers before we move on to shopping, trading, and selling and stuff. Uh, will we be able to give play, other players access to drop cargo off in our hangers? Uh, yeah. So what we want to build is this concept of a freight elevator that is tied to whoever's using it. So when you use it, you see your local inventory stored at, at Area 18. When I use it, I see mine. So. Now what you get is the ability for you to bring your cargo out into my hangar, load it on my ship. We can collectively work together as a group to then load the ship up with a, a series of goods, take it to another location, and then go go and sell it. So we, we thought that that was a really important factor to hit. Um, you know, players want to play as a group and, and putting the bill for, you know, 18 million UEC of, of goods uh, on a ship is is pretty daunting right so it, it 
I think it's a it's a huge it's a huge win for players just uh, not just for for working together as a multi crew ship but also contributing together uh, from a financial point of view of, of sharing the cost for for trading so I, I think that's a, a big one. Yeah, and I think Rob's bearing the lead here a little bit. Um, if you were if you were paying really close attention, you will have noticed that there was quite a dramatic change to the way that cargo works implied in that answer. Yes. Which That's is true. that we're not going to be magically spawning the cargo into your ship whenever you purchase cargo. Instead, it's going to be uh, purchased into the hangar, and you if you will be calling it from the spread elevator and then manually moving it in and out of the, the kind of staging space into the ship, right? So this is part of, you, I mentioned before that we're trying to localize the cargo more. This is part of that, you know, where we're getting rid of the magic, no more no more popping in and out of existence. Instead, they're physical things, they have to be moved. Of course, you know, in the future, this is gonna set us up for systems such as maybe drones or NPCs that you can hire to help you move these things. Um, but for now, the idea is that you can move them yourself using the multi-tool or you can bring in your friends. And so, you know, this is one way in which people that are playing together will have an advantage over players that are just playing by themselves because there's a certain amount of throughput that you'll be able to achieve with a, a larger crew, which will increase your um, financials uh, right. as opposed to as a single player. So it's it's kind of bringing that, you know, multiplayer interactive diegetic physical gameplay into the cargo system. You all laughed at the trolleys. You said the trolleys were silly. No, I'm just, uh, uh, Chad is already talking about an LTI forklift. I'll pass it on folks, but who knows? No, uh, it's, it's a big deal though. And, and uh, actually, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about it with selling here, so. All right, so. Um, we know that there's a there, 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 there's a there's a big refactor to or a big expansion rather probably more accurate to personal inventory and stuff coming, uh, and along with that, loot generation and along with that, uh, an increased need to be able to sell and trade things off. Absolutely. So, um, talk to us about what our what what our, what our scope of that is. I, I know it's you know we're not like with most things we ne we don't get to do everything we want to in the first drop. Sure. So. Yeah. What, why don't we just start there? What is next for selling, trading, shopping, asset managing? Yeah, what, so the, the big one is uh, we're trying to close off some of these game loops, right? Uh, we, we can go out, we can buy stuff, we can already sell commodities. So the, the next logical step was to be able to sell personal items or ship items back to shops, uh, just offloading. Uh, you know, you bought 57 different ships, but you're just like, you know, I just want to manage, you know, a small set of power plants or, or whatever that's that's a doable thing now um the the goal is to start with those item types um generally kind of mm. limit them to the, the types of items that the store will have for sale right uh and then you know go from there the selling ships back to you know a dealer uh is going to be a, a future tier right uh, but the the important part is, you know, when we start going to loot generation, you're going to be able to collect a lot more stuff. May or may not be valuable, but it's it's another form of being able to be rewarded within the game to be able to go and sell it somewhere. So that's a uh, it closes uh, several you know gameplay loops that uh, are either coming online very soon or you know have been there for, for more than a bit. And it also gives us an opportunity to actually. Uh, change our shopping flow in the in, in the kiosk it's going to be in the kiosk i should say uh we're, we're not going to do it at the physical item level uh the the moby glass level we're going to try and phase out that moby glass uh ui at, at some point um but the the in in converting it to building blocks we can kind of re-envision that flow a little bit and try and make it a little more user friendly um, selling things in stacks, buying things, you know, in larger volumes. Um, and, and these, these things will all be, uh, if you buy things, they're going to get, you know, sent to your local inventory. If you sell things, you can only sell things from your, from your person, from your ships that are in that location, from your local storage that's in that location. So again, kind of leaning into that, you know, items are localized within the world concept. Uh, it's, it's going to fall in line with all that. Hmm. Um, 
some questions that we got from the chat and thread here. Uh, want to trade, want to sell, want to buy are some of the more common mechanics in other MMOs. Uh, related to all this, are, are we going to allow players to trade between themselves, like with an old style MMO, uh, with or without, uh, what is the app, the MoTrader app? Is that what's called, MoTrader? Yep. Uh, short answer, yes. Uh, absolutely. Long answer, um, there's a series of confluence pages with to be clear the the current mo trader app is not even tier one it's tier zero of what we want want to implement for that um with just plan after plan for how to expand upon that in in gradiated bits um to include player trading there's talk even of having it be that there might be like shipping times on that that you might hire a shipping company then players could be that shipping company so yes absolutely player trading of items between each other is is planned to be supported uh what exact form that ends up taking will be determined when we you know actually start to pedal to the metal on that that next step right uh as we often stay here with, even with uh, a wonderfully talented 700 person team around the world we can only work on so many things at any one time and not everything is in active development so you can't there are no updates to give uh and i'm talking to you ben and merchantman crowd when it's in development we'll, we'll tell you okay 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 uh, uh, with the addition to being able to sell loot, are there plans to be able to resell a ship purchase with AUEC? Uh, it would be nice to be able to get rid of entries on ASOP for ships that maybe I don't care for after I have purchased them. Sure. I, I mean, that's the plan, right, is we want you to be able to, to sell your ships back if you don't. It, basically, anything in the game, if you, if you don't want it anymore, we want to give the players a way to manage their inventory and cull it down to the things that they care about. Um, I, I could even see, you know, as we, we re-envision the ASOP, because the ASOP's going to need to change a little bit when we do some persistent hangar work. Um, I could see maybe even just like, hey, hide this and, you know, show, you know, give, give your the ability to just hide certain entries, uh, but they're still there, right? Uh, all the way to selling them to, to do another stuff. So it's, um, you know, we, we want to eventually be able to take ships to junk sites and, you know, scrap them. And, and you know, if you're a pirate, right, that's, that's a big question in the game. It's like, how do I steal something, and sell this big ship? Well, that's that's pretty, uh, that's got to be a pretty complicated and, and, you know, dangerous thing. But that's, you know, stuff that CR has talked about in the past, right? So it's uh, it's all in an effort to build up towards, you know, that level of, of ability to buy, sell, you know, legal goods, stolen goods, stolen ships legal ships right it's yeah but yeah yep. what i'll say is that um R rob mentioned before that it's it's later it's not going to be the first iteration of selling and that's because ships in the game are much more important and for that reason on the back end in, in the persistent layer we're doing a lot more tracking we're, we use a lot more safety mechanisms regarding ships yeah. if you you know because of a bug or whatever lose a, a weapon or an item or something like that it's not that big of a deal um, but losing a ship is, you know, the amount of money that's going into these, the amount of time that's going into them is dramatic. So for that reason, uh, we would have to account for that, for example, in LTP. Uh, and to date, we don't remove things from LTP. So that's, a, that's you know, as soon as you, you do something like that, you open yourself up to a set of, you know, bugs that you have to be very cautious about on the technical side, that you're very confident when you go out, you're not going to start just blasting people's like very persistent data that they've worked hours and hours on. So we're, we're being cautious on that part. Uh, and it's it's not that we don't you know know how to do it or um, you know don't want to do it. It's it's more that we want to be careful on that one <laughs> for, for sure. For sure. Uh, let's see. Let's move into some more general term things for the team here. Uh, will there be more reputation stuff for people on the wrong side of the law? Uh, absolutely. Uh, definitely. And, and that's not even, I'm not even saying that as like a, a far off, super distant thing. Um, I literally spent yesterday setting up some data for it. Uh, when it comes out will be a question mark. Keep your eye on the roadmap as Jared is so fond of saying. Um, but the there there is planned support for pretty much any kind of gameplay in the game 
with reputation. The idea is that what you guys enjoy doing, we want to kind of support with that reward system. Um, if that means uh, hauling cargo from place to place, there will be reputation for it. If that means uh, shooting people along a trade route as a pirate, there will be reputation for that, both good and bad. If that means stealing Big Benny's machines and going and building weird Neolithic monuments on a moon um, for some reason, I'm sure narrative would have a problem with it, but there might be a reputation for that uh, with some weird organization. So yes, uh, there will be reputation for illegal things, for nonviolent things, for all kinds of things. Yeah, and uh, you know, the, the, we've talked about pyro uh, quite a bit, you know, this yes. it's, it's a big thing, right? And that's more of an outlaw system that's gonna be, you know, uh, coming online. So it's definitely gonna be more re relevant as we get into that. Um, but uh, yeah, as for now, we're we're focused on uh, you know design-wise, we're, we're building out the structure behind the scenes of how this is going to work in the game, and and that's actually something we're going to talk about uh, in a bit more de detail with CitizenCon. Yeah, so we're excited to show you some plans for that. Uh, adjacent to the cargo refactor, and we'll get back to that in a minute. Will the cargo refactor include a meaningful overhaul? of the economy itself uh, for updated profit and investment ratios? I, I think it has to. Um, you know, one of the things that we want to do is, is sell things kind of by the box, not like this per unit, because the, it does a lot of different things when we start to go down that road where uh, it takes a certain amount of money to get into a box, a super valuable box that's this big. Um, whereas, you know, I can, I can get into like the, the really cheap stuff in larger volumes maybe they're really expensive stuff. I can only buy in, in smaller quantities, but I've got to get a certain amount of it in order to, it's like buying a lot size on the on the stock market, right? You got to buy it in a hundred unit lots. Uh, similar principle uh, w with what we want to do for the cargo. And it, and it kind of ties to, you know, the whole sea in these large containers that that we need to, to have to facilitate those. Um, but it, it's, abs I, I don't see how we can't, you know, do that. Like it's it's mandatory. 100%. Okay. Uh, let's move back to the cargo refactor a bit. When it comes to loading and unloading of cargo in space, docking arms for ships and in hangars, uh, how do you plan to protect the player ship from, from someone coming on board during a manual loading process and flying away or stowing on board, stowing away on board? Uh, basically, how can players protect themselves during this vulnerable time? Yeah, I I think the bigger question is how are you going to protect your ship and your cargo that's being loaded and unloaded on your ship? Uh, who are you going to work with to make that that a safe thing? I mean, to me, that's that's where multiplayer gameplay just shines, right? And and it's how, you know you want to hire some friends. So eventually, we want to have NPCs that you can hire. Uh, maybe your reputation's high enough where where turrets at the station will actually help protect you, right? Um, so, you know, we, you're going to see reputation being tied into a lot more things as we move forward. Um, and certainly, you know, we've talked about hiring NPCs and, and working with other players forever, right? So th this, to me, is, is ripe for that opportunity. Yeah, and if I could add, like, I think a lot of people might hear that answer and be maybe a little bit upset. Um, keep in mind that you're not moving the cargo in and out on the landing pad. Right, we're changing it to be in the hangar, right. and to get into somebody else's hangar is going to be much more difficult. Uh, ATC is going to be monitoring That's ships, true. right, that are going in and out. Like if you just end up in somebody else's hangar, bad things could happen. Uh, if you want to physically walk in there, you're going to have to sneak in along with it. You can't just decide via some hangar elevator that you want to go to somebody else's. You would have to get into the physical hangar with them, and then get all the way into their hangar. Right. So there is just a lot less likely that this is going to happen. And so for the first outing, yeah, it's, it's probably going to be a little bit more manual process in collaboration with ATC. And my guess is that when we go live, there is going to be a certain amount of it, but it's not going to be like this rampant problem. And then um, even if it does end up being like that, we can always do things like introduce maybe like a super security system. And maybe that's something you have to opt into. You know, I don't know. We'll see how it goes. We'll see how the gameplay turns out. We'll see what the feedback is. Um, but yeah, so it's it's a little bit safer than I think maybe Rob, yeah. you know, made it. Well, and, and and I uh, I think one thing that we've kind of blurred the line between a little bit here is that you know the the cargo refactor 
is physicalizing cargo. It's, it's not going to change the shopping flow for that particular feature. Persistent hangers is where cargo gameplay flow is going to be the, the, the big thing that changes that. So uh, when it comes to shops, shops are still populated, you know, while your ships despawned, uh, you know, behind the scenes there. It just means that as a player, once it gets spawned on a landing pad, you can walk into the ship and take it out if you can get in there. Uh, it's it's physicalized at that point. So uh, the persistent hangar work is what's really going to drive this entire gameplay flow of, of the, the manual loading and working with friends and collaborating on that level. Uh, and then you will be much safer behind the, the doors of your uh, of your hangar. So making things harder to do is, is like I kind of mentioned, like stealing ships, like that should be really hard. Like it should be really hard to get into somebody's hangar. Like maybe you got to kind of sneak on their ship and then, you know, be a stowaway all the way back to get inside their hangar. And now now you, you you can wreak havoc, but it's it takes an effort, and it's a um, you know uh, I'm sure players are going to do it. I guarantee it. They're they're going to find a way. Uh, but I think just the physicalization of cargo is going to be a, a huge step. Okay. Uh, we we're t we've talked a lot today about the cargo refactor and how it links up with the persistent hangers and stuff like this. Where do cargo decks come into this equation? You know, we released them uh, a couple patches ago. They famously looked great, but were less filling as far as the gameplay content. Uh, how do those work into the, the new picture? So the there are hangers at those stations, right? Cargo decks uh, are places where you, know, you make your purchases. Uh, we, we originally um, intended that to be where you can kind of drive renting space. We've actually since talked about some additional possibilities of how we're going to manage uh, your overage and 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 is that a is it capped is it just per unit like you pay f for the storage that you you request for maybe that that gets way more expensive the the more you get closer to certain you know uh levels um that you know small stations may not have a lot of space and when once you get up to like thousand scu like man that gets really expensive and it's just not worth it to store that much stuff there so um it, it's I'd, I'd see it maybe morphs a little bit over time here, just as far as the, the original intent. Um, obviously, I, I think one of the, the big points was that, you know, they're, they're not really connected to the outside, so people can't really fly their ships in and load it up and go out. But that's that's where persistent hangers, you know, even if you don't own one there, you can request a land one, uh, pay for it, you know, like 500 UEC to go land, and then you go in, do your shopping, load it on your ship, and then go, and then that hangar disappears from your your persistence right so again it's 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 realizing the the gameplay over time uh that that's this is a huge feature um we've built so much in the game already and and we've got to go go back and make sure that what we're building still works within the context of everything that we've got uh and so i'd, I'd expect you know there'd be things kind of like that, that that may need to get tweaked a little bit uh we may be able to use it right out the gate gotcha um and then uh does this cargo refactor uh does it include things like the store all boxes for the aurora and the mustang at all um are you talking about the boxes on the outside the yeah ship? yes so the the it, because they're items it's like a, a weapon it's just attaching to the outside of the ship so it will absolutely facilitate that Ten thousand aurora own, owners just Yay. cheered in unison now loading uh, that's going to be interesting, right? So <laughs> you got to get your track to be, you know. So that's a that's a different problem. But uh, with per, uh, let's see how much time we got. All right, with persistent hangers, uh, will the need to equip ships only with the inventory you have in the hangar or at your current location be implemented at the same time? That's actually going to be coming out with these this new inventory uh, change that we're doing. So when the asset manager drops the personal inventory. Uh, system is changing, right? The the PMA will be removed uh, in lieu of the new personal inner thought inventory that, that you probably see in Rich Tire and, and company talk about quite a bit. Uh, the VMA will also fall in line with that. So the VMA will still exist, but it'll be altered to only show the things that you have at that location or purchased at that location. Uh, so you'll see the equipment from all of your other ships that, you know, you know obviously everything's like item port size restricted and, and stuff like that. but um, yeah, so it'll, it'll be localized there. Uh, with 
things like persistent hangers, uh, the physicalized inventory, asset manager, all the stuff that we're talking about that's coming, how does prison factor into that and being an escapee? Uh, had, uh, that's the question. That's it's, How does that factor in? It's I guess um, in what way? Like getting back to your... Yeah, ha, ha, like, yeah, at what point do you get all of your stuff back? Because you know, when, you, when you show up in prison, everything famously disappears. Uh, sure. But, well, it... it I think it I think it works even better because we've had to actually hack the, the inventory to work around that fact uh, to hide all of these other things that was previously in a global inventory. Uh, so you just won't have it right like your, your stuff will just not be at that location. So of course you can't access it. So when you get back to places where you can, it'll be there. Yeah, but, and I think you know there's still some fine details to work exactly yeah. out, but probably you know like one way that it could work is. Uh, if you were at a location where you got captured, um, we just store it there. If you're somewhere where there's not really reasonably anything close that you could identify as the location where your stuff is, we'd probably just stuff it in your home location. Um, but as I said, there's some fine details exactly um, to sort. And then, you know, the immediate next question, I'm sure that a lot of people are thinking, but like, how do I know where it ended up? Right. And, and the answer to that is, well, that's why we have the asset manager app, which is to help you understand where your things are in the world. So yeah, the, uh, we haven't really talked about. It. We will talk about this in more detail at Citizen Con. But think of Asset Manager as the global view, and your your personal inventory and, and uh, persistent hangers, your ships. Like the, these are all your local local places. So when you want to know what's on the other side of the system, that'll be the Asset Manager or Knickknacks uh, is the actual name of it. Uh, again, I know we're talking about the Asset Manager at Citizen Con, so we don't want to go too far into it, but. Uh, Will it allow for like text-based global search of inventories? It's chat. You wanna? Yeah. So what it will allow is text-based filtering of local results uh, at first, but not global text search. And the reason for this is because um, it's actually uh, much more difficult to implement than you might just naively think. You have to consider how you're extracting that data out of the back end. The way that we're implementing the new entity graph system is to optimize it for the kinds of queries that Gameplay does most often. And that usually means hierarchical queries. And for this reason, the way that the data is laid out in the database is not conducive to text-based search. Uh, instead, we would have to have a different kind of caching layer in order to facilitate this um, which is doable. It's it's not that it's not possible. It's just that that's not the work that's currently being done. We're very focused on server meshing, entity graph, persistence, streaming, all that stuff. Um, so the people that we would need to work with in order to support that are, are tied up with some very important things right now. And uh, it won't be in, in the, like the global search won't be out in the first uh, outing, but it is something that we've definitely talked about and we have some ideas yeah. about how to yeah. And on, on that note, um, we, we actually found that the we put in an item type subtype. So the, the categories and, and subcategories that you would see like in the shop Kia. So you got your categories across the top, like, oh, clothing, and then pants, shirts, whatever. We're giving that level of, of filtering where you can set up your criteria, say, yeah, filter, and then only the stuff in that location that matches that that criteria uh, will show up. So it's, it's, a, it's a little more efficient way to go Where's my guns? Where's my clothes? Where's my uh, whatever? Um, but uh, the the text search because we're also limited on how many things we can put or or bring into the query uh, results each time, uh, just because it it'll just take longer and longer for things to load. So we felt it was better to give you faster results than okay. to create this huge list, wait for it to load, you know, for 15 minutes, right, and then allow you to to interact with it. Um, so we've actually, I, th I think we've actually turned the, the text-based filtering off right now because the, the the type subtype or the category stuff was so much more efficient. We're like, hey, let's just let's nix that and give them a little more space to to show items. So it's not out of the question. It's just not. No, no. It, it it was one of the first things I wanted. I'm like, I want to I want to type. You know, much like we have in the the friends list in the front end, right, where you can start typing somebody's name and and see them you know, pop up in the list. Like that's exactly what I want as a player. And I want to, I want to be able to type keywords. I want to be able to type, you know, uh, like sniper or, you know, bullet or whatever. Uh, that's as uh, is, is a game that manages so much stuff. We have to have those quick and easy ways to not just 
figure out where what it is but where it is and what i need to do to go and get it how much of it i got right what quality what shape is it in you know there's a there's a bunch of stuff that will be coming into play much more as we move forward yeah, you can send your hate mail to me uh, yeah. i had to i had to break the bad news to rob that yeah. it chat i tried <laughs> so chat, he, 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 was, he wasn't calling you naive he was just calling director gunner it was that was directed specifically to director gunner yeah everybody else is fine yeah. he, he just meant director gunner um <laughs> I don't know why I'm picking on director gunner. Uh, will reputation affect selling price or taxes on trading or selling loot at some point in the future? Absolutely. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, that is one of the core. So there's a there's a portion of reputation uh, that is like one of our very public, very core plans of it that is perks. Um, you've got a very small amount of that that you saw with the bounty hunter reputations where you get a little bit more mission rewards as you rank up with uh, certain organizations. Um, this would fold under the the expansion of that into much more varietous and much more interesting perks. Um, th that's actually one of the simpler ones, frankly. Uh, the it might be a specific shop if it's like a little mom and pop store that you've gotten a really good reputation with that specific person, or it might be company wide if there's like uh, Garrity Defense, then you you can you know get all of those various stores. Um, but yes, absolutely. When you're selling, uh, and, and taxes and all of that could be affected by reputation, um, in certain areas. Yeah. Buying and selling. Uh, we and talked buying. about hi hiding things behind reputation, you know, so you yes. gotta be ex reputation. Uh, you gotta be a private with us in order to, to buy our, our weapons. Um, we also wanted to, you know, it ties into subscriber flair as well, right? Like we've always talked about wanting to put a subscriber shop in there. So guess what? subscriber is just a, a reputation that is a, a, a boolean on or off you know and, um but and, and that is kind of like one of the core when when we say like oh this thing will give you x item it generally will more give you access to x items yes, and and exactly. that's why when you fall below that rank we aren't going to take that out of your inventory because that's just rude frankly um it's that that item might decay to a point where uh it is broken or needs to be repaired or something and you won't be able to get it back until you're uh, back in working order until you are above certain reputations or get a replacement until you're above that. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and as we move forward uh, with, with the game, obviously wear and tear is going to become much, uh, much bigger of an influence over, over your gameplay. Like right now we do a lot of things with ships where we basically just give you all brand new, you know, stuff when you uh, claim insurance, but eventually the, the intent is that like your parts are wearing out. So if you lose your rep to be able to buy, you know, have access to it, you may not have to uh, or you may not be able to get it repaired by them or uh you may not be able to get another one so it's yeah it, it's it's I, I can't express how fundamental reputation is to our progression system uh enough it is it is huge and it's going to be tied into as many things that make sense but it's going to be in in most of the stuff that we work on it's it's going to be a factor and as a follow-up to that uh, subscriber flare thing, uh, we're talking about many subscriber flares get lost throughout the course sure. of you know adventuring in the for yeah. universe. So we're talking about an easy place for people to go back and reclaim the things that they have already. Yeah, lost I mean that's like that. that's an interesting you know point. I, you know, they, typically you know with the, the players are just doing like character resets and then getting their stuff back, right? Um, reclaiming it, like we have talked about, you know if you lost it, maybe at some point somebody could find it, right? And then it gets returned to your home location where you can go and pick it up. There, there is talks about how we can do that for some of those key items like the subscriber things or like the, the things that you you know paid real money for or um, the, the special stuff, right? You know, the, your, your special mount or et cetera, uh, so to speak. But yeah, that's, that's a, it's, it's, it's in the plan. I, I don't know when that's scheduled or, or it, it's an evolution of the shopping shopping experience for sure. And I know next year is going to be much more uh, economy focused as we kind of get the, the quantum uh, tooling integrated into the game more and more. So uh, that's that's what I would like to see that happen. But it, it's all going to come down to priorities. Yeah, I, 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 I also I, should clarify for Zenithret, we are going to directly reward you some stuff at certain reputations after the event is done. Um, but that is something that we do not plan to do long term. That's a yeah. Kind of a one -off. So that's that's a good point. Like right now, we're we're kind of doing it in a in a undesirable way where we're 
going through the the analytics data and going ah who's actually completed this and then and then yeah. attributing those things to the accounts the, these are things that we want people to uh be able to one acknowledge go yep cool i'm going to this place and i get it and i did it and i know that i did it whereas right now the back end just goes yep you got it and there's not a whole lot of messaging you don't really you know um once the inventory is localized, you're like, where do I go get it? Well, we've got plans for that as well. But um, yeah, so hopefully it'll it'll become more fluid and more more tangible in-game experiences with, with the reward stuff that they're doing now. Cool. Well, gentlemen, that's it. It's the end of our show. That's it. Congratulations. Thanks. You made it to the end. Uh, mm. All that's left is for uh, Chad to show us what that thing in the background is and how it works. It's a power cage just for weightlifting. <laughs> you gonna show us or he doesn't know how it works so it's... <laughs> all right that's it that's <laughs> uh, why don't you come over and discuss that cool. Uh, cool. Th thanks for spending your time at the end of our week here on star season live uh that was Ch that was chad that was rob that was that was that, can I point in the corner? There we go. That was that was Ben. Uh, we are gonna we're gonna throw a raid. I think we're gonna throw a raid uh, to somebody here. Uh, so uh, there is a streamer going now. His name uh, their name is Nayashi. Uh, Nayashi. Uh, I don't know anything about this person. Uh, we're, we're literally just picking a person. and We're gonna surprise him. So uh, so um, when you when you when you head over there, tell him uh, Chad doesn't really work out. And uh, we'll uh, we'll see you next week, everybody. I, no, I'm not saying he doesn't. I'm just saying I've never seen him use it. That's all. I've never seen him use it. I've not. You it know. just sits back there. It's like he's swole, dude. Have you ch checked him? Like he's swole, before, man. Before, before the camera, like he's like, oh, yeah, dude. It's those legs, they're like powerlifter legs, man. He's got like <laughs> robot. We're, we are off the air, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs>